Good afternoon. My name is Jim Lyko, and I'm here in Avon, Connecticut. In Avon, Connecticut on July 14, 2008. I'm going to interview Mr. Richard Hill, retired U.S. Navy. This interview is for Central Connecticut State University, an official partner with the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress. So, good afternoon, Dick. Good afternoon, Jim. How are you? Fine, thank you. Good, good. Thank you for, for agreeing to this interview. So, to begin, let's talk about where you were born and, and uh, family life and growing up uh, in that town. Okay. I was born in Buffalo, New York, uh, 1928. Uh, I lived there and went to school to about the fourth grade. Uh, I was the baby of the family. I had two older sisters, uh, and a dog. And, uh, my dad had worked for American Standard for, oh, some 15, 20 years. He's a veteran of World War One, And, uh, we, uh, he moved to Utica, New York to take a better job. And then to Syracuse, uh, New York. Uh, and that was probably around 1938. Uh, my sisters and I went to school. I was in the fifth grade uh, in New Hartford. And uh, then, as I said, we moved to Syracuse. I took a real avid interest uh, in the war, even prior to uh, the United States entering the war in uh, 1941. I can remember... Uh, listening to the radio uh, in the evening with my parents as to what was going on over in uh, Germany and what Hitler was up to. And uh, we'd have quite a few uh, discussions about it uh, with my parents and my two uh, older sisters. Uh, naturally, uh, in, in Syracuse, uh, the weather wasn't any better than Buffalo uh, or Utica. We seemed to stick in the snow belt. But uh, I had a job uh, peddling papers, the Morning Post Standard, uh, when I was around 10. And uh, I, I really uh, had a great interest in the war. And I remember I was delivering the, uh, the, uh, the paper uh, that morning of uh, December 7th and finding out about uh, Japan, uh, striking uh, uh, Pearl Harbor. And I could say roughly that all through my high school years, uh, I, I really had a end to, not only was I following it, but I really eventually, as I was in high school, wanted to get in the Navy. And I know my close friends, there was three or four of us uh, together. We just dreamed and talked about being a... Uh, aerial gunner in the U.S. Navy uh, Air Force. And uh, those were our aspirations. Uh, as, uh, well, when I turned 17, uh, the war was over. I can remember celebrating Bree Day and, uh, you know, naturally, uh, all of us were very happy. Uh, I was a little sad that I missed out. Uh, having really wanted to get into service. And there was an awful lot going on at the time anyways with the occupation forces and what have you. So um, the three of us were bound determined to still go in the Navy. So I talked my parents uh, into signing for me on my 17th birthday. So you needed a signature on, uh, at 17th? It, definitely, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it was rather difficult because I was in my senior year of high school. But uh, I said I wanted to go in and, uh, you know, I'll make it up when I get back and finish and so on. So I guess you could say reluctantly they, they signed approval. And I was shipped off to Camp Perry, Virginia. And uh, then I, I quickly found out what uh, discipline was and uh, 
what a change in lifestyles. Uh, washing your own sheets and bed and going through inspections and getting dragged out at all hours of night and uh, going through all sorts of things uh, in addition to march, 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 march. Uh, but as I look back on it, it was uh, really a learning process and uh, I guess you could say it was enjoyable. But uh, I graduated in Camp Perry. Uh, we graduated out of boot camp in Camp Perry. Uh, I have a picture here of uh, our graduation. And uh, it uh, that was in March 1946. Okay. Uh, I come home on seven days... Uh, Seven days leave and uh, really enjoyed my visit home. Now I was in the Navy and all filled to wear my uniform and see all my friends and old girlfriends and so forth. Uh, upon returning to Camp Perry, uh, I would say within a, within two weeks, uh, we boarded a uh, troop train for uh, California. Uh, it was going to be about a four four day trip, four or five days, uh, and uh, it was very exciting. I had an upper bunk, and uh, I can remember. I think it was the first morning I woke up <clears throat> from sleeping in the upper bunk. Uh, I had a cigarette, and I, you weren't supposed to be smoking, but I had the curtains drawn on my bunk, and I said, oh, "What the heck." And uh, the, uh, I don't know if it was the patrol officer or the officer in charge of, the, of that particular car come by and pulled up in my curtains and said, are you smoking? And as I said, no, all the smoke poured out of my mouth. And I was immediately placed on KP duty for the remainder of the trip, which turned out to be the best deal going because I was uh, working in the dining car and in the kitchen and... Uh, so you're on KP duty on a train. On a train, Wonderful. right. Yes. And uh, yeah, I had, I had a lot more freedom there. I had my choice of food. The guys were great. Whenever the train would stop, uh, we had a little more freedom just jumping off and getting out than the rest of the, the rest of the sailors did. So that, that turned out pretty good. But I went to, uh, we went to um, the base in Oakland. We were there for roughly about two months. I volunteered for some duty. I remember uh, manning one of the uh, the oil uh, heaters or something for the barracks. And so I had a lot of freedom there. Uh, used to go on Liberty, but uh, trouble was uh, you weren't allowed in any bars or anything. And uh, it kind of took all the fun out of it. Why, but, why weren't you allowed in bars? Well, at the age was 21 years old. Oh, there you go. <laughs> and uh, yes. even at 17, I might have snuck by if it was 18, but yeah. uh, uh, it was 21. But we weren't there that long, and we uh, got shipped over to Treasure Island, uh, right, uh, right on the coast, uh, and actually one mile from Alcatraz. Uh, we had our orders. Uh, we were going to Guam, and we were waiting for a ship uh, to uh, take us to Guam. And while we were on Alcatraz, uh, excuse me, while we were on Treasure Island, uh, I don't know many people remember, but they had a big outbreak at uh, Alcatraz, and a bunch of prisoners took over portions of the prison. And uh, they weren't sure what was going to happen. And uh, we could stand right down on the shore on Treasure Island and look right over at all the activity of the, uh, the uh, Coast Guard and uh, Navy and local police forces and what have you going back and forth and the helicopters flying around. And uh, for a couple of days, it was... Uh, days, yeah. A lot of your searchlights all night, light at night, going on and yeah. what have you, and uh, finally they were subdued and things got back to normal. I did have an opportunity uh, years later to visit Alcatraz and see where all that took place. Yeah. But um, 
finally, we um, the USS Mitchell uh, troop transport uh, uh, took us to Guam. I forget how many days it took to get there, uh, but we were put in a receiving station on Guam and uh, had our barracks in a Quonset hut, and we're waiting assignment. Uh, and it wasn't long before I was assigned to uh, a unit at Cam Mariana's headquarters command. Uh, it was up on top of a, of a, well, somewhat of a mountain where the U.S. Navy had their headquarters command and so forth. And I was assigned along with 16 others to, uh, uh, to an ensign in charge who... Uh, uh, had responsibility for the USO compound where they housed uh, all the USO entertainers who would come over occasionally to entertain the troops at that time. And uh, we lived right right there at that uh, particular uh, uh, station for the USO compound. And about a mile away was the Red Cross compound where they housed all of the uh, USO personnel. And uh, there was a restaurant where both of those pr uh, people, uh, all those people, would gather, eat, and have cocktails and so forth. So we ran that along with the laundry. Uh, because I had taken bookkeeping in high school uh, or what have you, they thought I was a good administrator. And I was given the job of running this Red Cross compound. And... Uh, it, it was quite interesting. Uh, I think Jim Wicks was the uh, Red Cross uh, personnel director for the uh, South South Pacific. Uh, and he was a real fine gentleman. We got along very well. And uh, all I had to do was make sure that uh, the uh, Guamanian personnel, how we had to clean the barracks and so forth, and everything was clean. And if we did get other guests, which we did, females on the island, they would stay there. And there was a charge just like a hotel, and we'd collect monies and so forth, and et cetera. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> it was there that I had my first uh, look-see at Japanese uh, soldiers uh, because... They worked on uh, picking up the trash at the local, uh, well, all over uh, the different places. Mm -hmm. They'd come up in the big trash truck and pick it up and load up and what have you. And uh, it was funny. They had nicknames Tojo and all of this and that. And uh, a lot of them used to uh, make paintings out of little handkerchiefs or they would take spoons or any kind of silverware they could get their hands on and they would make them into rings and pound them into rings and then they would sell them to you mainly for cigarettes or something of that nature. So that was uh, the first encounter I ever had with any uh, of the Japanese uh, soldiers at so that time. Were these ex-prisoners? They, they were still prisoners of war at the time. The they were that. still, they had not been uh, uh, Sent back, released, relieved, and sent back. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. Uh, and also on that island uh, for for years after, I know even after I left Guam, uh, there were Jap. They would, every once in a while they would catch a Japanese soldier who had been hiding out, didn't know the war was over, and of course with their line of code would not surrender, or what have you. And they'd be around trying to steal food or anything they could. And every once in a while you'd read where they found one, whether they were living in caves or jungle or what have you. And they would catch them. Wow. And um, that went on for quite a few years uh, before that happened. Uh, I, the duty I had there was unbelievable. Uh, <laughs> and uh, after a while they were going to close the Red Cross unit. And uh, so I was assigned, I ran the laundry there. And uh, 
we were on it. The laundry was uh, right where the Marine barracks were, and uh, we did a lot of the uh, of the uh, staff sergeants from Marine Corps and what have you. One who ran the mess hall, one who ran the store supplies and what have you. So you could barter a lot, and uh, you lived pretty good. And the brig was right next door. Uh, the Marine brig was for the island was right next door to the laundry. And they used to come down every Saturday and clean our laundry for us. So it was it was pretty good duty. We had uh, seven or eight uh, Guamanian women who used to do all the ironing and the starching of the clothes and what have you. Um, and then the Marine barracks took over that. And uh, for a while I drove uh, uh, a limousine for an admiral, I forget his name who was visiting the island. And I got to see a lot of parts of the island, the leopard colony and what have you, that I wouldn't normally have seen. Uh, one last episode on Guam. Uh, uh, we had a uh, couple of us had found an old sailboat that needed repair. And we repaired it, got it going. We thought, great, we can go sealing, sailing. And... Uh, they have a, a beautiful bay there called Talafufu Bay. Uh, it's an old sunken Jap ship in the middle of the harbor. And um, five of us uh, went down there and took the boat down. And uh, we we're going to take it for a ride. And uh, three of us uh, left first and we're going to come back and pick the other two. Uh, because we had a, an expert sailor with us. He was going to do the navigating. Uh, we shot out of that harbor like uh, bad out of hell. And uh, I'm not a sailor. I mean, I don't sail <laughs> boats. But uh, he uh, he went to turn that, and the mast broke right, right off the boat. And uh, there we were... Uh, this is a picture of the... Uh, up a little higher. Up, uh, yes. There you go. Perfect. Yeah. That's a picture of the... Uh, the bay. Of the beautiful bay. Yeah. There with the sunken ship in the middle of it. Okay. But it's really at the far southern end of the island. In fact, a couple miles down is the... Uh, uh, the leopard... Where the leopard colony was. But um, we started to drift from that... <laughs> that island. And we thought we better do something. And um, so we'd tie a rope around us and the other to the boat, and we'd take turns uh, jumping in the water and uh, swimming towards shore and towing the boat in. And this went on for several hours, quite a few hours. So you're jumping in the water with a rope tied around you, swimming to try and pull the boat through the water. Correct. That was That's, that's the idea. Tough duty. Tough duty, well, Dick. It was, but I... <laughs> After several or uh, many hours, uh, yeah. as we got in closer to shore, then the, the, the waves and the tide started to push us closer to shore. So we, we landed on a, a desolate uh, beach and uh, started to uh, walk inland. And we were walking in uh, kind of like swamp uh, with floating coconuts and what have you with water up to our knees. And uh, it was getting dark, pretty, pretty, pretty close to dark. And uh, I would guess after a mile or so, we finally stumbled on a, on a dirt road. We started walking on a road, and I can remember some Guamanians came by in a jeep, and were trying to flag them down. And they took off like a bat out of hell. Well, about a half hour later. Uh, finally, uh, two jeeps come down at shore patrol. So they had told us the Guamanians thought we were Japanese uh, and what have you. But they picked us up. Uh, by now, it's it's pitch dark and uh, it, it's getting a little cold and what have you. And uh, we're starved and what have you. And they finally, uh, they had to take us all back to headquarters command and... Uh, uh, to make a long story short, while all this was happening, our two friends, after hours of waiting for us, reported us missing, and they had air and sea rescue out looking for us. Oh, my goodness. 
which we didn't know. Well, uh, next day we had a report uh, at Captain's Mass, and we went before Captain's Mass at Headquarters Command, and we were stick to the base, which that was no problem. We couldn't go anywhere <laughs> anyways, but uh, received some extra duty. And you're, what, 18 years old, 17, 18 years old? I, I was, uh, let's see, at that time, uh, I was uh, 17. 17? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was still 17. Yeah. Because I had only been in service about a year uh, at that time. But um, aside from all those experiences, uh, you know, I still had a yen to, to get to see and see yeah. some of the world someplace. Uh, I didn't join the Navy to spend uh, a couple of years on Guam. And a couple of other fellows felt the same way. So we uh, got a Jeep and drove down to the harbor and uh, the USS Mole was in port. We went aboard and talked to the executive officer uh, if he needed any personnel. And uh, actually all we could do was be seamen because we had no experience aboard ship. And uh, he, he was really enthusiastic because, uh, uh, you know, with the war being over and a lot of reserves, he was lost a lot of personnel yeah. and was shorthanded. So uh, he said, if you can go back to your command and they're willing to release you and get a transfer, fine. We'll be glad to welcome you aboard. So, and the mole is a uh, destroyer. D destroyer. Uh, like this, right? Yeah, that's it. DD-693. Beautiful, yeah. And uh, So you went on board and applied for a job and, uh, and things worked out. Things worked out. Yeah. Although I remember the... Uh, the warrant officer uh, at uh, Camp Marianas, he would only agree to the transfer if we would agree to extend for two years. Well, three of us, they were young, went, yeah, we agree. Mm -hmm. But when we got aboard ship with our papers and the executive officer looked at him, he says, what, you want to extend for two Well, no, but that's the only way we could... Uh, Get him to get the papers. He said, "What well, the hell with that? We don't. You don't have to do that." And he struck it from our records, and we all were tickled to death. That's right, yeah. But um, so th there we were. We were aboard ship, and uh, I was in the deck hand. I was a deck hand, and uh, which meant a lot of chipping paint and uh, painting and uh, maintenance duties yeah. such as that. Yeah. Uh, but we were headed for Manila, and we spent uh, a week or two weeks in the Philippines uh, and going on some maneuvers and what have you uh, with a carrier. And then we went on to uh, China, visited Tsingtao, China, and we tied up along a big uh, hospital ship there. And uh, geez, it was pretty amazing. I bought the best pair of tailor made. Uh, these Chinese came aboard ship with their sewing machines and everything else, and uh, would just uh, you know make you tailor made and what have you. Yes, tailor made uniform. Tailor made uniform. If you're in the Navy, yeah. you had to have a tailor made set of blues, nice gabardine blues. Yeah. But uh, going ashore there, uh, the poverty and uh, you had to be careful where you went because, uh, you know, you could get in some bad sections in the Chinese gangs there or what have you. You may never be, make it back to the ship. And we used to dump our garbage right in ports there. And, uh, <clears throat> which, you know, you never do, but uh, in most ports you go to. But um, the China, we put our trash cans, they were back on the fantail. And they'd just dump them over. And you would see all in our waste is going right out at the same time. And you'd see all these uh, young Chinese kids and what have you out there swimming, separating the turds and what have you from the food and filling up cans and taking them to the, the dock and, uh, and eating. It was just uh, wow, that is a terrible, terrible sight. Uh, but when we left China, uh, we uh, went to Japan, uh, 
and I'm, I'm trying to think where we, the city we, uh, we visited in Japan. You know, I, I can't think of it. It wasn't either one of the cities uh, where that got bombed or anything. Um, Yokosuke or something like that. But uh, uh, we got Libby there, went ashore. And, uh, you know, you talk about the transition of yen and what have you. Uh, you know, it, it was pretty amazing the yen you got for the for the um, for the dollar bill, uh, it was quite high, mm -hmm. um, but the government, uh, MacArthur, uh, you had to use uh, the script money. But all of us would smuggle a little a few dollars in our secret pocket in our navy uniform, and uh, you could go ashore and uh, and uh, meet merchants and what have you, and make a hell of a, hell of a deal for the. Uh, for dollars for yen, because they were happy for the dollars, and yeah. you, with the yen, you you improved your your buying power tremendously. Uh, and I guess what impressed me about uh, Japan at that time, that just after the war, like that, uh, uh, the people there just treated you with the most most respect, and. Uh, you know, almost would get out of your way and what have you, and were very, uh, very kind to you, or nice to you, and uh, it, and compared to China, it, it was it was very clean and uh, very orderly and what have you. So that was a nice experience, and that pretty much ended our travels uh, at that time for our trip. Uh, to the far Pacific. Now, when uh, you traveled, Dick, did you travel in, in uh, convoy? Were you uh, on the mole? Uh, on the mole, on there, the was, uh, there was there uh, was four a squadron of four destroyers, and uh, at part of the time we did some escort duty for the carrier, uh, but uh, at that uh, to visit between China and Japan, there was just uh, the four destroyers that were were traveling. And when we left there, uh, we we traveled alone, and we were headed back to the States, and we stopped at uh, Pearl Harbor. <clears throat> and as I say, we we traveled. We were traveling alone uh, at that time. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I just love the sea and uh, in the Pacific, just the beautiful weather and uh, cruising at night and uh, what have you, just, just gorgeous. We used to steal potatoes out of the bed, and at night we'd get up on the up on the second deck and had a little hot plate and cook some potatoes and onions and uh, what have you. And uh, and if there was any any beer you had available there, but that was seldom had. Um, but it was just great. What were your duties on ship? Uh, uh, my duties, as I say, were mostly uh, as a seaman. You were as seaman. We we were chipping paint constantly and painting. Okay. Right. Uh, <clears throat> my um, uh, geez, I forget uh, battle stations. Uh, I was in a five-inch mount uh, uh, at battle stations. Uh, and uh, down in the below deck, passing up ammunition. Um, so were you in one of these guns here? Uh, well, actually, I was below deck, uh, okay. uh, where we uh, put ammunition, five-inch shells, on the conveyor belt that would run up topside. Uh, later on, I did move up to the mount, uh, uh, but that was only for a short time. Um, they say we we were stopping at uh, at Pearl Harbor. Uh, the mole had the honor to escort the first cargo award dead uh, back to the United States. Tell me about that. Um, we uh, I, I remember we were uh, uh, we were riding or. or <laughs> Uh, alongside the, the, the sh cargo ship with the war dead. We anchored outside of San Francisco, 
And uh, I remember that night there was all sorts of communications going back and forth because they were going to have quite a ceremony the next day when we pulled in under the Golden Gate Bridge and uh, and that ship docked there. Um, uh, the city and the officials were having, there was a lot of fanfare and a ceremony, uh, honor award that and so forth. So um, the next morning at daybreak, we uh, we cruised in with that ship uh, and uh, under the Golden Gate Bridge and uh, Right into uh, the dock, and it was uh, it was quite touching. Uh, um, of course, we were standing at attention uh, uh, while that was happening. Uh, I had some pictures of that uh, that you can look at later. Uh, of that <clears throat> as we went under the Golden Gate Bridge and uh, what have you. So uh, we stayed in San Francisco for, I believe, a couple of weeks. And then we headed uh, south to San Diego, uh, where we tied up in the, uh, in the harbor in San Diego. And uh, I was eventually discharged from San Diego, uh, or from the Navy at the San Diego Naval, uh, Navy base. Uh, and the ship stayed there. Uh, for I think quite a while before it went to uh, back out to the Pacific. So your two years were up back in San Diego. Then. Correct. Yeah. But you got to see. You well, got I got I got to see, and I got to see a lot. Absolutely. You know, at that yeah. time, not long after, not many people got to see China, yeah. uh, the way our relations were yeah. and what have you, and getting to Japan and uh, it. Uh, I, I thought I was extremely lucky. Things worked out very well. I was getting discharged uh, early, uh, beginning of December, be home for Christmas. And uh, so what was it like at home? Now you've, you've come back with uh, these experiences and uh, uh, just uh, well, to be home <laughs> and you were a bit of a celebrity in the neighborhood. Uh, well, yeah, amongst friends, family, and what have you, and, uh, you know, and uh, what are you going to do now, and, uh, you know, just, uh, but for a while, I was just going to take it a little bit easy and what have you, uh, enjoy all of the excitement, clamor, and, uh, and decide what I was going to do. Uh, I, wanted to, uh, I wanted to do something about my education. You're 19, uh, no, 19. Right. Yeah. Uh, I can remember going back to high school and telling them I wanted to go back <laughs> to high school. And I, I, in my day, had a few run-ins with the principal and vice principal, but uh, <laughs> I, I think he kind of chuckled. I don't think he was too happy. <laughs> to, uh, now, this is in Syracuse? This is in Syracuse, oh, this yeah. High East, Eastwood High School. Eastwood. Yeah. But um, he, he accepted me back, and... Uh, I went one year, and uh, I, uh, I did. I had. I was taking some different subjects, and I had talked to Syracuse University, and uh, I was thinking of going to Syracuse University. Uh, and I forget how what transpired, but I ended up taking the high school equivalency exam which I did and pass. I think it was because my marks weren't that good in high school, because I goofed off a lot. I could use my high school equivalency and uh, have less trouble getting into college and mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, so I, I had a lot of courses to go. I started going to night school. And uh, I guess when I, uh, a, a group of us, uh, well, one of the fellows that joined the Navy with me originally, uh, and another fellow, we decided we'd join the reserves. They had a uh, active re naval reserve post uh, out of a lake called Onondaga Lake in Liverpool, New York. And uh, so we decided uh, we were going to join, which we did. And our first night of having to go to report for uh, duty, 
the rest of the group was away on their two-week uh, training exercise. So there was a <clears throat> solid old chief there, and he says, well, you know, you can stay and spend your time here and look around and get acquainted with the place. And I'll never forget, uh, one, of the, one of the fellows was a, uh, uh, was a gunner's mate and had experience on a dual 40 millimeter mount, which are on destroyers. And they had one in this, uh, in this room. And um, they have two joysticks, one on each side of the, the, the mount, and one is for elevation of the guns, and the other is to turn the turret around. And he was showing us how to work, and he was working one with the turret going around. And I was on the other one, and I was working the barrels up and down. And somehow, the last I remember, the turret was coming around. I had the barrels coming down like this. And there was a long table there full of radar equipment just stacked on that whole table. And that turret came around and the barrels were at the right level and made a whole clean sweep of that table. And all the radar goes crashing on the floor. The chief comes charging in there. What the hell happened? Well, I can't repeat all he said, but <laughs> we really got chewed out royally. And the reason I tell that story is, um, it was about that time when things were getting hot in Korea, and uh, uh, we were the first three to be called to active duty out of that post. And we're very suspicious. I that, wonder why. <laughs> that had something to do with yeah. it. So you were officially out of the Navy until you joined the Reserve. Correct. Then... Being in the reserves, you became eligible for any problems that were going on. And of course, as you say, Korea was beginning to heat up. So right. they had the ability to, to call us call back. Us. Okay. I just got called back later on, but sure, we were the, yeah. the first the three first to three, go. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, after getting things in order and saying, oh boy, here we go again. Uh, we got our orders and we went to Brooklyn Navy Yard and I would say we were there probably oh three or four weeks as we got you know uniforms this and that and got all the paperwork and everything back in and physicals and uh, I I got my orders uh, to report to Charleston, South Carolina, uh, to the uh, USS Walden DD-699. Uh, uh, it was out of commission. It was in mothballs at the time. And it hadn't been in mothballs very long. Uh, but we were going to put it back into commission. And my other two friends uh, got shipped to the West Coast. Uh, and I thoroughly thought that we'll put that ship back in commission and uh, we'll go through the, the, the canal and the uh, Panama Canal and head to the Pacific, to the war zone. Uh, and after putting the ship, we put the ship back in commission. Uh, What's involved with putting a ship back in commission? Well, a, a lot of hard work, getting all of the uh, the the tar and uh, uh, you know all of the preservative. Osmoly, all that stuff they put on for preservation. I yeah, see right. What you're uh, it has to be every every bit of it. Yeah. And of course, um, when I went aboard ship, I was still a seaman. But I got talking to a chief petty officer, Torpedoman, and uh, he was looking for some hands, and he told me he would like me and his crew. So uh, I said, fine. Uh, and it was a small crew, uh, chief and about six of us at the time. Uh, but we had one hell of a job of... Uh, 
those torpedo tubes were were just unbelievable dirty, and you find yourself inside the tubes, uh, five of them cleaning them out and what have you. And then working on the K guns and the depth charges on the depth charge rack on the back, fan tail. Uh, and then, uh, you know, just uh, then you got to learn about the makings of a torpedo and the gyro compasses and what it runs on, the alcohol, so forth. And uh, uh, so there was an awful lot of preparation there. And of course, everybody on the ship was busy getting the ship back into commissioning. So we're, we're uh, recommissioning uh, the, uh, the Walden. Yeah, correct, the DD-693. We're in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, the Walden hadn't been uh, without a commission that long. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, being part of the torpedo uh, crew, uh, I think that's the official name of what they called it. Uh, it took us uh, several months in uh, Charleston, three months or so, to, uh, to get the ship ready for sea again. And they had a recommissioning exercise uh, of the USS uh, Waldron. Yes. Uh, and this, this took place in Charleston. And our captain, uh, his name was uh, Shaw, uh, Commander J.C. Shaw. Uh, he, was, uh, he was a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy, the class of 1936. And uh, after graduation, he served uh, in cruisers and destroyers and was the uh, Asiatic uh, Neutrality Patrol and the destroyer Stewart uh, until August 41. Uh, he was assigned duty as assistant gunnery officer and later, later gunnery officer of the USS Bunker Hill. And uh, he, uh, shortly after the close of World War II, he served as a flag secretary uh, to the commander of the 5th Fleet, then engaged in the occupation duties in Japan. And for the past two years, he has worked with Captain Samuel E. Morrison, the Pulitzer Prize historian, writing the history of the U.S. naval operations of World War II. So um, he has quite an impressive background. Okay. And, uh, and this is a ceremony they had for the recommissioning? The recommissioning of the ship. And uh, after recommissioning the ship, we uh, we uh, started uh, to have our shakedown trials, and um, we went up to uh, Norfolk, Virginia, and uh, we do daily exercises pulling out of Norfolk, and uh, again uh, testing out all of the uh, ship's uh, equipment and everything else. And as we passed muster in all these trials, we headed for Cuba for some serious uh, uh, training. And uh, that's Guantanamo Bay, mm -hmm. where we, we spent quite a bit of time uh, there, uh, pulling out to sea and uh, practicing very maneuvers, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of gunnery uh, uh, practice. And uh, you say gunnery practice, you're actually firing the guns. We're, we're, we're actually uh, battle conditions, right? We would fire them at drones, uh, oh. going being pulled by the planes. Uh, uh, we would fire them at targets, surface targets that were being told by other ships, and also we did shore bombardment activities and uh. I don't know, um, where was it, Costa Rica or uh, Puerto Rico, where the U.S. Navy had a, had a base here recently that, uh, that uh, the island, I think it was Puerto Rico, they didn't, they wanted to kick the Navy out and they didn't want us to use that and we, the Navy used that primary uh, for practice uh, artillery fire and shore bombardment activities. 
and we participated in some of those activities back then when we were uh, on our shakedown cruise with the uh, with the Waldron, and of course we no longer can do that. But um, and during that time we visited a few of the islands around, and took cruises so the the uh, the uh, the crew could get liberty and what have you. So we we had an opportunity to visit some islands in the Caribbean, St. Thomas, uh, Kingston, Jamaica, and, uh, Haiti, and a few of the other islands down there. Um, and then we came back to Norfolk, which I, I guess you could say was our, our home uh, port at the time. And uh, I still thought we'd probably be going at that time over to the Pacific, but uh, Lo and behold, we uh, had our orders that we were going on a, a goodwill visit uh, to Europe and the Mediterranean. And uh, that was quite exciting when we, uh, we kind of heard where we might be going. Um, we started out and uh, we went to uh, Newfoundland and... Uh, then we pulled into Reykjavik, Iceland, and uh, had liberty there for a few days. And we were going to take a trip up around uh, around Iceland uh, into the Arctic Circle. And of course, that meant that we would all become blue noses, uh, the order of blue noses, for having passed over into the Arctic Circle. Now, what is that? Uh, that's the first time I've heard that expression. Maybe, that's the... Uh, maybe term or... Uh, well, uh, you're passing the... Uh, what is it? The... The Arctic Circle. The Arctic Circle. Yeah, but I'm trying to think what yeah. degree that is. Yeah, uh, that's up there. Right, yeah. Uh, there's a degree for it, but it, it, it is a Navy thing. It's like uh, you cross the equator, right. you know, right. it's a, the same... Type of thing. Right. Only this is. This gives you a blue nose. This right? gives you a so blue nose. Yeah, yes, and, and and they don't have quite the uh, ceremonial Ceremony. activities yeah. associated with the with the equator. Right. Uh, we just all accepted our card as becoming yeah. blue noses. But um, we were going to do that, and we were picking up. Uh, uh, I, I think it was around uh, twelve to fourteen. Army personnel, mainly uh, staff sergeants, uh, enlisted men, uh, stationed in Reykjavik, uh, U.S. Army, uh, to come aboard the ship and take the uh, trip up around the island with us. Uh, and they were stationed up near the uh, chief's quarters in the very bow of the ship. Uh, things were peaceful till we got up... Uh, over the Arctic Circle and uh, uh, to the northern part of the island. The island being Iceland. In Iceland, so yes. Around Iceland, you've taken in the this is the Arctic Circle. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. All right. And uh, we ran into heavy seas, the heaviest I had ever experienced. Uh, the uh, it was just. Uh, you know, un unbelievable at the uh, at the, uh, the how heavy the sea. It was my first really exposure uh, to to something of this sort, and uh, for literally two whole days, uh, the crew was restricted to uh, pretty much their 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 bunks. And strapped in at that. If you weren't strapped in, you'd get tossed right out of your bunk. And uh, nobody was out on deck. Um, your food uh, for two whole days, regardless if it was breakfast, lunch, or supper, uh, there was a, a big box of bologna sandwiches and hot coffee. And uh, that that was it. And you went in and help yourself when you wanted to. Uh, the the mess hall benches were not even put down. They were strapped up on top of the table. And uh, it, 
uh, he would laugh at uh, anyone venturing with their coffee and sandwich, uh, stepping over the hatchway uh, into the mess hall as the ship would take a deep plunge down. Uh, <laughs> you, you felt like you were stepping down uh, 10 feet. Uh, there were numerous accidents, to say the least. Uh, I had two, uh, two warm experiences during that trip. Uh, I used to stay in Helm Watch, and uh, that was my uh, at sea duty. Uh, and I pulled the 12 to 4 watch, and I, I can remember being up on the bridge, and uh, the officer of the deck, most of the orders were, uh, just study as you go, heading right into the storm, because you didn't dare take any other course than into the storm, because you're afraid you would uh, roll over what the force of the waves were, which at one time the Walden took a 60-degree roll, which is pretty tremendous. Uh, but uh, up there on the bridge and mining at helm, uh, when the when the bow of the ship would uh, hit a trough and plunge down in, the water would come right over the windows on the bridge, and the fan tail would pop out, and uh, the screws would grind as they're in the air. And uh, then the next thing you know, the bow would come up and the fan tail would go way back down. So, it, you know, uh, it, it was just uh, <laughs> damn exciting uh, at that time. And that lasted for two days. For two days. And uh, during the, the second day, uh, there was an awful lot of clinging back on the fan tail. Where my bunk was was in the fan tail. And uh, below the, it was below the fantail. Uh, I made my way up to the torpedo shack and the uh, van of the chief. And he said, "You got to get back there. There's a uh, there's a deck charge rolling loose back on the deck." So I got another uh, member of the torpedo man gang, and uh, we got some rope and. Uh, we uh, went up on the main deck and went outside and tied ourselves down to one of the K-guns and um, waited to the uh, to that. We could see the deck charge rolling back and forth, and we waited until it got over to one side so we could quickly catch it uh, or, or get a rope on it before it started rolling the other side, having both of us being tied to the rope. We, we did manage to secure that and what have you. And at times when that bow of fantail went down in the water, you, you were looking right out at the water, uh, eye level. Uh, uh, the water off that was higher than what you were actually. Uh, so we were anxious to get it done and get the hell out of there and get, <laughs> get back inside. So those were two hairy experiences. And we, we finally... Uh, now you had all these army personnel with you, huh? Did they uh, uh, well, weather the storm all right? Or they... Well, it's very strange. We never saw them the whole yeah. two, two, two days. <laughs> and uh, we, we, after the weather subsided somewhat, we hightailed it back to Rectavik. And um, then we saw them coming out of the forward uh, hold and... Uh, God, they were they were a sad looking group of, uh, of men. I, I I don't blame. Them. I just felt terribly sorry for them. Uh, even an old Navy salt uh, would have difficulty up they there in the bow. Houses, didn't they? Yeah, they sure did. <laughs> they sure did. So and with that, we we did leave Rectavik and uh, we headed uh, on to our mission to uh, Plymouth, England. Um, this, this was um, uh, there was a, there was a lot going on. Our, as I said, uh, our captain uh, had quite a schedule set for us. Um, Plymouth, England, is uh, it used to be kind of a resort area, uh, and right near there is Portsmouth, England, where the uh, English naval base is. Uh, 
so we had some some good liberty in Plymouth, England. Uh, naturally, this was exciting exciting to me again. Here's another country and uh, what have you. Uh, we uh, we were there. Uh, oh, I, I roughly uh, quite a few weeks, during which time uh, all the time we were over in that general area of England, Ireland, and uh, in the English Channel, we were doing a lot of maneuvers with the English Navy uh, and a lot of submarine patrol and submarine uh, exercises, uh, searching out for submarines and so forth. Uh, after a while at Plymouth, we went to uh, Southampton. Uh, and in, in Southampton, uh, we pulled in there and we had the distinction honor of, uh, of uh, having the mayor, uh, I guess you call it the mayor counselor, uh, come aboard our ship. Uh, our, where we were tied up, we were right uh, in front of the uh, Queen Elizabeth, and here's a, a nice picture which pretty much shows that. Yeah. And uh, again, that was quite exciting. You can see how our ship is kind of dwarfed by the by the size of the uh, Queen, Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth. Now you're in this picture, I understand. Maybe you can point that out. Well. I had uh, I was in the honor guard, honor guard okay. and when the mayor uh, came aboard ship to pay us a visit, uh, I, we stood honor guard for her, uh, and uh, it was it was quite interesting. Um, later, they had a ceremony in town where we marched in the uh, in the parade. Yeah. Uh, representing our ship, and there was another another, shot an, the, another uh, ship. Another Waldron there. There's a, there's another. Yeah, of that ceremony day. Yeah. Right. Uh, this was all done because the um, our commanding uh, our commander, uh, our captain of the ship, and uh, the other ship that uh, were there, uh, uh, both visited the mayor to pay the respects, uh, and. Uh, there was, a, there was a big article, which you'll see later, uh, uh, visit by two American destroyers in the in the local paper. So they made a lot of fanfare out of it and, and what have you. And uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it, even, uh, even though I almost didn't get in the Navy because of flat feet, I was still in the marching unit for our, our ship. <laughs> Excellent. You look good in the, uh, the iron guard there. Yeah. Um, and so after we, we left... Uh, we left Southampton, and uh, we went. Uh, had the good fortune of uh, going up the uh, Ruan, the Ruan River, or the river to Ruan, France, and we had liberty. Uh, we had liberty there. And in that town, there's a, there's a, remember, there's a great Catholic church there that, uh, I believe it's a Catholic church that we had the opportunity to visit. And from there, I know um, another fellow of myself uh, took a 40-hour pass to go to Paris. So we did get to see Paris for 48 hours. We hopped the train and... Uh, I remember drinking wine on the train, as all Frenchmen do, and uh, and having a great time, and uh, and catching our train back, and uh, it was very exciting for for I know for myself, and, uh, and then we went to, uh, we went to Bremerhaven, Germany, and uh, had liberty there, uh, which is a big seaport. And we went up the river to Hamburg, Germany, mm -hmm. and tied up right in the center of town in Hamburg, Germany. And uh, you know, out of all of the countries I've visited so far, which are many, 
uh, yeah, they're, they're all beautiful. Uh, you know, it's funny. I found I found Hamburg, Germany, to uh, what I want to say uh, be more like America than any any other city. Yeah. Uh, too, the, the restaurants, the uh, people, everything. Uh, I, I just found it to be uh, much more like America, the United States, uh, mm -hmm. than the others. Uh, England, uh, I don't know, so-so. Uh, of course, Paris, was, uh, France was very romantic and... Yes. You know, you can't help but like, like that. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so, um, after all that exciting time, uh, naturally we had to go to Ireland. And uh, we, we spent, we went to Ireland. I know we spent a couple weeks there. Went to Liverpool, England, back to Ireland. And again, we were we were pulling a lot of uh, daily uh, type of uh, naval maneuvers and and uh, submarine search and things of that nature. So you're going between these countries for a reason, I mean, right? Were you taking advantage of your travel by uh, with the maneuvers? Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say. Uh, Either that way or it was the other way. I'm not sure yeah. who way, but but anyways, and uh, Ireland was quite a <clears throat> quite interesting. Uh, uh, of course, back then they still, you know, it was free Ireland, and uh, they still had a lot of activities going on and uh, and so forth. But uh, I remember taking the bus and and going from Ireland to Free Ireland and. You know, it's just like crossing a border, so to speak, and what have you. But uh, we had an awful lot of fun visiting the Irish pubs, uh, enjoying the countryside, uh, going to the Irish dances, and uh, it, it, it was uh, everything you would think Ireland would be. Uh, between Ireland and England, eating their, uh, drinking their, uh, their warm beer, and there are uh, bitters and orange and what have you, uh, you know, it, uh, it it can't be that you go to U.S. Yeah, well, it's the experience of yeah. having, uh... So from there, uh, we, we sailed south and uh, we went to Gibraltar. And now we are alone. We are we're traveling alone. No other ships uh, at the time. Uh, we went to Gibraltar, and uh, I, I was really interested uh, in Gibraltar because my grandfather came from Spain. And in fact, lived in Gibraltar mm -hmm. and got a ship out of there when he was fourteen years old. So. Uh, that, that was really interesting, and my mother was quite happy that I got a chance to get there and, and, and go through the Straits of Gibraltar and so on. And uh, from there, we went to Syracuse, Sicily. Now you're in the Mediterranean. We're in the Mediterranean, right? And uh, we, we spent a week or so in Syracuse, Sicily. Um, and I didn't meet any people from the mafia or anything like that. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it's uh, yeah, they were there, they, they, I'm sure they were. Uh, if we had anything to offer, they probably would have <laughs> made contact. But <laughs> um, and we went to Naples uh, from there, Naples, Italy, and uh, Naples just a, a beautiful, beautiful city. But also, I have to say, one of the filthiest cities I've. Oh, really? I, I, I just uh, from the time you got off the ship uh, until you got up uh, in the countryside or what have you. Uh, but it, it uh, yeah, it, it was, uh, and and the, and the people you were, they were at you from the minute you got off the ship, you know, for any other any kind of activity you wanted. Oh yeah, yeah. 
And uh, I know we had some cigarettes uh, and uh, uh, two friends and myself, we, we had taped some cig cartons of cigarettes to our legs under our navy blues and what have you. And because we heard you could you could uh, make some swaps for a Beretta, which you know we wanted to get a, one of those Italian Beretta yeah. guns to bring back home sure. with us. And I can distinctly remember uh, meeting these people and uh, going down an alley, and uh, they had the guns and showed us the guns, and we had the cigarettes and. Uh, well, first, excuse me, I got that mixed up. We were going to trade the cigarettes for money and then buy the guns with the money. And when I said they had the guns, they had the wads of money, like a 10,000 lira note right on the outside and what have you, and uh, they they would let you, you know, look at it and count it and, and go through it, and, you know, the money's all there. And uh, then they went to see the cigarettes and hold the cigarettes. And all this was going back and forth. And all we know is that within a few minutes, we had the money, they had the cigarettes. They tore the hell out of there. And we looked at our money, and we had nothing but paper inside the 10,000 liter note. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so that was the end of our... <laughs> paper. Yeah. Laced it with uh, Big Bill. With Big Bill and that. But they had the other there because that went, you know, we did have our hands on the money. Oh, sure, yeah. And, but, you know, this so this kind of thing switched point, yeah. back and forth. Oh. Yeah. yeah. They got you on that one. They, they sure did. Oh. They sure did. Um, we had nursing friends we went to, uh, that I really enjoyed was uh, went to the uh, lost city of Pompeii. And, um, Went all through the rooms of uh, of Pompeii, and that was just uh, extremely, extremely interesting. I mean, uh, how well they that is all pres preserved and what have you, and uh, you could go in where the drugstore supposedly was and uh, see inscriptions in the wall and things of that nature, and you could go where maybe it was a beautiful home. And, see where the baths were and this and that. And uh, you could see where the chariot paths were worn into the stone on the roadways. And fascinating. Huh? It, it, extremely, extremely yeah. fascinating. You could go into uh, uh, where the house of the two was and what have you, and the different backs and what have you carved on the, on the stone and all this stuff. And uh, it, it, it was just very, yeah. very interesting. Uh, it was a lost city of pleasure, I guess, for I the Romans. So. Uh, yeah. The fact that they were able to discover it and restore it so that we can appreciate it today. Is, uh, yeah, it's pretty amazing. You know, had to take a lot of work to dig that out from uh, Mount, uh, what is that, Mount? Vesuvius. Vesuvius, yeah. 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 Oh, it's on my list to go visit. Yeah. So yeah. But I guess they've done a lot more with it since yeah. then. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, after we left there, uh, we went up to uh, Trieste and uh, totally different from Naples. And that big square in Trieste there uh, with the government buildings all around it and uh, just, just beautiful. Restaurant food's a lot different up there in Trieste. Uh, and uh, it, it just... Uh, uh, what I want to say, well, it was a big, it was much different than Naples. And, uh, you know, you, you, nobody ever bothered you up in Trieste. You, know, you just might have been another citizen there or what have you, you know. Uh, nobody got excited over that you were there. Nobody tried to sell you anything or, or what have you. Uh, so that, that was an interesting visit. Then, uh, and probably the, the, uh, the last stop on this tour, uh, Venice. Uh, we, we tied right up in this uh, Grand Canal in, in Venice. Uh, 
Oh, really? You get right in there, huh? Yeah, we, we the right, right opening there. through the opening yeah. and, right, and right in, and, you know, we, we could look right, right ashore over there and what have you. And uh, the gondolas, uh, they, uh, they, were, they would be out there selling us everything yeah. under the sun. And we got taken there again a couple of times, uh, um, selling us booze for uh, if we were on ship, you know, and you didn't have liberty, it might barter for a bottle, of vino or something or other yeah. for cigarettes. And uh, so it was funny, uh, the guys got, they started getting out of iron and uh, melting the wax on the carton of cigarettes, taking the cigarettes out. In the carpenter shop, made blocks of wood, and we stuffed the car. You were gonna get even. Carton, <laughs> carton with, with, with block of wood and seal the wax back. Up. And, so they and felt, we, felt like it. Yeah, it, you know, and uh, <laughs> it was funny. A couple of times, these gondolas we gonna make the swap. We get our bottle of vino, and they would paddle all the ways a while, and all of a sudden you see someone open up and. Oh, <laughs> you know, and start screaming bloody murder. Well, it's really funny, yeah. <laughs> that's, but that's, uh, that's a great story. It, it was just you know t to go ashore there and uh, the land of the canals and uh, yeah. and we did take some uh, tours and gondolas around and what have you. The Leaning Tower of Pisa, the Opera House, and uh, and it's it just remarkable. I know our gunner, the officer, Lieutenant Cook. <laughs> he was like, we could have the hell out of him. He got, had a little too much to drink, I guess, a night in Liberty on the way out. He fell in one of the canals and what have you. And, uh, and embarrassing that to have him coming back so that <laughs> board the ship. But it, uh, it's just a beautiful yeah. thing. It's amazing how those buildings and what have you stand. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in that yeah. water and the waves and uh, yeah. you know, I guess now they got a lot of power boats in there and they're very leery about the power boats. Wow, and they're also strengthening the buildings to try to keep them from uh, from collapsing. collapsing yes. yeah. But it still it, it remains a, a very very special place to visit. I know. Oh, certainly, yeah. So with that, we. Um, we eventually started our voyage back, uh, back stateside, and we did some. Uh, we we joined up. We did some cruiser duty, and uh, we I mean, um, carrier duty. Pardon me, uh, escorting. I forget the name of the carrier, uh, but uh, that was always exciting when you were escorting uh, uh, the big carrier and what have you. To see them cruising through the the water as big as they were and as fast as they could go, they could go as fast as the destroyer, most of them. Yeah. And uh, we refuel at sea, and uh, and again, you know, to to come up alongside of them, and you could almost say shouting distance uh, back and forth, and uh, to to refuel. And uh, I know occasionally I would have helm duty when we were refueling at sea. Which is uh, which is a little uh, a little treacherous. There, uh, you don't have too much leeway, and you're both dead on course. Uh, and what's helm duty requirement? Are you actually at the helm? Yeah, you're actually at the helm. You're steering the you're boat, steer, you're keeping the distance while right. you refuel. Oh, right. Okay, uh, that's a responsibility. Under the jurisdiction of the yeah. uh, the officer of the deck at yeah. the time, and what have you, and uh, you know you. Uh, you're really keeping uh, watching that compass and keeping it on course. Uh, and it's, uh, now, who's taking the fuel? Are you, or is the destroyer? Uh, the, the, oh, the destroyer is taking it from the carrier. Taking it from the carrier. Oh yeah, okay. yeah. That's what they used to they always used to do. You would they you'd pull up alongside of them. They would shoot over a small line, and you pull that in, and you pull in a heavier line, and it would uh, a big six, six inch. Uh, Right. Hose, bring it over, and the boatswain mate would tie that down, and uh, there'd be an outlet on the side of the the uh, side of the deck where you would put that in there and 
you know, often refueling. So the car- the carrier was the supplier of the, uh, the yeah. fuel because of its size. It could right. They could carry a lot, a yeah. lot of fuel, okay. and they might, you know, if if they got two or three or four destroyers there, uh, they they would refuel all of the destroyers. Wow. Okay. So they they would carry. Now, where would they get their fuel then? then they... When they were in port. <laughs> I see. So that they had that much capacity. Yeah, right. Right. Okay. Now, it, you know, if at times there were a sea a long time and not no port, then a tanker would uh, have to supply the carrier, yeah, yeah. you know. But that would be all taken care of. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So um, we came back to uh, we came back to uh, Norfolk, Virginia, mm-hmm. and. Uh, I want to. We were tied up there for. I don't know how long. I was. Uh, I was getting ready to. Uh, I was getting close to getting out. Uh, I discharge. Um, and uh, you know we'd have all the miscellaneous, miscellaneous duties aboard ship. Uh, uh, polish the brass. Uh, we would always have to after a trip like that. We would uh, always have to take out the uh, torpedoes one by one, place them on the uh, docks on the on the de- upper deck, go in and uh, swab out the inside of the torpedo, regrease it. Terrible, terrible job. <laughs> uh, regrease them all and what have you, and then uh, put after checking the compasses and everything else, and uh, putting the torpedoes back in. Putting the warhead back on, and uh, it, it would be quite a quite a job. And then, of course, in port, you'd reset all of the depth charges, K guns, and things of that that nature. So we were, we were quite busy. Uh, and we were going to be scheduled to take uh, another group of midshipmen. Um, for their uh, midshipmen crews uh, for training activities and what have you, uh, the so-called 90-day wonders. Uh, uh, and I think they were going back to Italy. And it, it's funny, I had uh, I had needed some dental work, and uh, I wanted to get the dental work done before I got discharged. So... Uh, I went aboard the tender there, the dentist, and uh, uh, he had uh, he had pulled a couple of teeth. I needed a partial plate, and uh, he said, "You know, we're not going to get this done before your ship leaves, but you should have it done." He said, uh, "Do you want to do you want to come aboard the ship, or, or you want to uh, get transferred off the ship and?" So I, I thought about it, and I didn't think I'd if we went over overseas again and came back, probably wouldn't have time to get my teeth fixed before I got discharged. Yeah, yeah. We're only talking about a few months, anyways. Yeah. So I said, "Why not?" So he issued the papers necessary for dental work. So I became part of his crew. I well, no, I was temporary stationed right on base there at at Norfolk. Okay. Uh, for medical work. I was still attached to the ship, but temporarily signed here for dental work. Okay. So I got all my teeth fixed, what have you. And I'm there and waiting and waiting, and uh, uh, finally they decided to uh, discharge me two months early. Oh, okay. So I got my discharge, and uh, in the meantime, I was... I was coming home every weekend, practically, or every other weekend. Back to Syracuse? Back to Syracuse. Oh, okay. Yeah. And uh, either one of the guys would be driving or this and that, or I'd get a ride to Ithaca and meet somebody there, and they would be driving down. And, uh, you know, Norfolk, Virginia, on a Monday, Monday morning at 6 o'clock is, uh, is a zoo. Everybody... 
coming back. The, the highway is a dangerous place uh, <laughs> at, at night. Everybody trying to get back. Everybody's their ships pull. Yeah, and their ships are pulling out. Yeah. You know, in the morning usually. And, you know, you got to be back bright and early. Yeah. But uh, anyways, uh, a friend of mine who was uh, in the army, uh, stationed in Jersey, he came down and picked me up. And he was going on leave and uh, brought me home to Syracuse. So there I was, uh, the free man again. That's wonderful. Wow, there weren't any countries left you couldn't visit, you haven't visited. No, I, I was so fortunate. Oh, that is a... So fortunate. I mean, the Pacific the first time, and then, you know, the Europe and Mediterranean the second time. Uh, Absolutely. Just, uh, Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, and... All of it in the Navy, which made it special. Sure. Uh, I, I thoroughly what enjoyed life it. Life was like when when you packed it in there in was it 1952? I guess no, you were, right. Then then you want to tell me what what you went on and did. Well, I uh, I came back and uh, I was going to go to college full time. I had some night like college, and. Uh, uh, but I needed a car, and uh, I decided I was going to go again to night school. I got a job working uh, Lindy Air Products, uh, Pyrofax gas, and you know, gas, propane, gasoline, or whatever, uh, through a couple of my friends. I bought a um, uh, 49 Ford, practically brand new. And um, I went to night school, University of Syracuse, uh, and I carried nine hours a semester. And I did that for about three years. So um, the professors there said, you know, I was crazy uh, not going to school full time and what have you. And I'm on the GI Bill. And uh, I was getting some monthly subsistence, but uh, you know, not you had to work. That's all. But I got to Syracuse University, and they talked me into taking engineering. Now here's a kid that you know, I might have been smart, had a high IQ, but I really goofed off a lot in school. I I know that. I had no math. So I was going to night school, high school, taking algebra, trig, and I don't know what else. Chem some something else. And I'm trying to take a, a, a full course on campus. Well, I stuck it off for the full year but I, I was doing miserable. Mm -hmm. And I went and talked to him. Uh, this counselor got on and said, well, you know, that's, that's ridiculous what you're trying to carry. Uh, you know, you're trying to play catch up to take over here what you're already taking. You should have had this before you started taking that. So anyway, so uh, I, I ended up dropping out and uh, I went back to night college continued working, got a job with the Hartford Insurance Company as an office manager trainee. And by this time, I, I got up to about three and a half years of college. And uh, I got transferred to Baltimore as the office manager, then to, uh, and I, I met, well, I knew my wife from Syracuse. While down there, I was getting transferred to Phoenix, Arizona. And we got married, went to Phoenix, Arizona, had our first son, and uh, went to San Francisco for a while, then got transferred to Minneapolis. All with the Hartford. All with the Hartford. Mm -hmm. And then back here to Hartford, okay. where we've been here since. Uh, around 1960, somewhere, uh, something like that. 
and I retired in 1990. Okay. And children? How many children do you have? You said you have I have three boys. Uh, okay. Rick, who lives in St. Petersburg, Florida, who I love to go and visit. And uh, I have a son, Mark, and a son, Scott. Uh, and they live just a mile from here. Oh, nice. That's right. The, the grandchildren now. Right. And oh. two, two grandchildren. Wonderful. So I, that pretty well sums it up, I guess. Is there any questions you got? Or well, I, I had a lot of them, but you're filling in all the blanks for me. I guess uh, the last couple of things I, I would want to ask you for this interview is, uh, you know, your fondest memory of service life. But uh, you sounded like uh, everything you did along the way uh, gave you a fond feeling. But uh, is that something you can pin down as to what, what you would uh, consider... Well, I don't want to help me grow up. Okay, yeah. it, it did wonders for me, sure. but uh, you know, I I just love to see. Yeah. Uh, uh, I did, naturally, you know, like I say, these all the countries I visited and, and the memories are, are there. But uh, you know, just under steam. Uh, I, I could I could I could sit uh I'd walk out of that torpedo shack with a cup of coffee and uh just sit there and watch the flying fish uh, you know, alongside the ship as we're cruising through the water and the waves. On the horizon, yeah. yeah, it just you know the stars, the moon and uh just just uh I I really enjoyed it. I came so close to shipping over, uh, you know, uh, but then uh, you get back home and you come home and leave for liberty. <laughs> All of a sudden, you, yeah. hey, wait a yeah. <laughs> you know, what are you doing? Have you, have you continued with uh, association with the sea? I mean, any kind of sailing or cruises or? Well, um, my wife does not like boats. Okay. So that limits my cruising. Absolutely. Uh, but I bought a boat for the kids, okay. and uh, a twenty foot outboard. Kept it down to a hand, then uh, down by the Good Speed Opera House, nice. and uh, you know, used to go. Uh, well, that's where they used to go water skiing a lot and what have you. But take it down to the Sound and what have you. So we did that for oh a, a good number of years, till I. And I got rid of the boat. Okay. Well, then you. So that that ends it. Yeah. How about uh, you, uh, veterans? I think uh, you mentioned that you do have some uh, association with veterans. So how how far did you uh, how involved did you get with uh, with uh, your sheet or your shipmates or a veterans organization after you you got out and well. You know, I signed up for the Tin Can Navy. Uh, I get their bulletins and follow the ships. I haven't gone to a reunion. Uh, I uh, The USS Waldron puts out a quarterly paper. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I'm, uh, I try to track. And like I mentioned to you, a lot of this stuff I haven't looked at for a long time. I found an old book with some addresses in there of some names because I was searching for names of guys that I had served with sure. and uh, I'd get confused as to was he on the mole or the Waldron or you know uh, but now that I got that I'm going to look that up and then to see if they're they're registered because I, I, I sent my email and what have you and um, I'd love to contact with them uh, I um, I had, had a couple of fine fellows recruit me into the Veterans of Foreign Wars, uh, which are uh, they're just a wonderful group of guys, and uh, I become very active uh, with them. And uh, 
you know, working all their drives, poppy drives, uh, uh, other activities they got going, and what have you, visiting schools and things of that nature, and uh, working for the vets, working for the Salvation Army on their Christmas drives and ring the bell type of thing, and uh, so that's that's been. Uh, they're pretty, pretty much it. Great association, yes, yeah. Yeah, of course the guys I all associate with the uh, at the Veteran Four War, uh, you know, quite a few of my World War Two veterans who have seen a lot of action and uh, what have you. But unfortunately, two, three of my close friends have since passed away within the in the last year, mm -hmm. which a lot of the World War Two vets are yes. are happening. It's the that's the importance of, of talking to, to guys like you who've uh, been out there and had the experience and can share that with people. It's uh, it's great history. You mentioned at the beginning of our interview how you were interested in the goings on of the war uh, and how interested you were and you would talk with your family about what was going on in Germany and uh, prior to the war. So having that interest and then having the opportunity to uh, travel the world and see all these historic places uh you put it all together nicely you know and uh, it's, it's uh, well you know i i thank you for contacting me well, although i yelled at george england for giving my name out <laughs> <laughs> and he's a wonderful guy but um uh i, I really thank you uh, for you know uh, uh being so nice and helpful walking me through this process and uh, as a result of your uh, calling me and asking me to participate in this, um, it really got me into going back and looking at a lot of data and information and pictures I had before. My wife says, well, for God's sake, you've been doing nothing but pouring over this stuff for two weeks. Do you want to practice your speech in front of me? Or, or what are all the, you know, because she hadn't seen a lot of the pictures and what have you. But, you know, it really uh, queued up my interest uh, or well, what I'm have glad. you. I'm glad that you did that and I'm glad that you shared it with us and, and made it part of the interview and it will we'll copy these documents and they'll become part of your permanent record and uh, it's uh, uh, I, I can't say enough either other than uh, it's it's been a, a pleasure and an honor to uh, interview another veteran for the uh, the uh, veterans history project and uh, uh, I guess with that I thank you I, I was going to ask you to to give me your thought the thoughts of Richard Hill on the US Navy and its effect on you uh, but you you covered that kind of nicely with your your uh, your associations and travels and, and I think what you said about stepping out with a cup of coffee and looking out at the horizon on a destroyer in mid-ocean is uh, pretty much a pretty wonderful experience and, and uh, I wish I could have had something similar to that. that uh, I'm sure you would have enjoyed it. Yes. Yeah. So with that, I thank you. I guess that we don't... Uh, we can wrap this up. Okay. Thank you again, Jim. Okay. Thank you, Richard Hill. And I'll have you hold this up just once more at the end. Perfect. Right there. Go back to this way just a little to the right. Excellent. And with that, I thank you on July 14th, 2008. Thank you, Richard. You know, Dick, we talked earlier about uh, when you were in the in the, in on the wall uh, the second time in the Navy. You were on the Waldron. You had some contact with uh, Russia and uh, your your impression of the Cold War. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, I, I guess I failed to mention that. But um, when we uh, when we left the states on our, our way to going to Europe, and we we're heading up toward Newfoundland and Reykjavik. Uh, Iceland. Um, I, I know they had to be planned this way, uh, but we, uh, because we explicitly <laughs> headed towards some uh, 
Russian fishing uh, vessels. Uh, there was the mother ship, uh, which was very large, and uh, and the fishing trawlers that uh, were operating in, in the area <coughs> fishing. And uh, uh, our destroyer and another one, uh, you know, it was almost like we bore down right on them. And uh, at some times uh, we would be at battle stations and the gun mounts would be moving around and uh, what have you. Um, you might say in a threatening statement, like gesture. Making a statement, yes. Right. And, uh, and we, were, we were so close as, uh, as we would kind of cruise alongside of them. Uh, we could, at the mother ship, we could see the Russians leaning on the railing, looking at us, some through binoculars, uh, some females standing on the, uh, on the deck there, uh, looking at us. And, uh, we'd go up one side and, uh, maybe come up and turn around and, uh, come back around again. And I, you know, for s several hours, uh, we might go through this, this exercise and, uh, you know, I, I'm sure the Navy probably didn't like their vessels within so close to uh, to uh, our country and what have you. And, uh, you know, with radar and everything else going, by the, whether that's all they were doing with fishing or yeah. spying or, or whatever. But it, uh, it was certainly an interesting uh, element of the Cold War, and you could see it very much in practice uh, at yeah. that time. And, and did this happen more than once, or did you... you oh, no, it, it happened two or three times. Two or three times, right? Yeah. So, and were you at battle stations at that point, or...? Um, most of the time, we would be at battle stations. Okay. Yeah. So it's, uh, but as we cruised away, we might not be, and, yeah. and then we might return and, and, and be at battle stations again. So, when they're looking at you through their binoculars, they're, they're seeing a, a destroyer poised and ready to... to uh, Make uh, a statement either way. You know? Oh, definitely. I, particularly with those uh, three uh, dual five-inch mounts maybe yeah. turning around and what have you. Yeah. It, it's, it, it, it could mean an awful lot oh, <laughs> if you were the so. enemy. I guess so. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Fine. Thank you. You're welcome.